This week's episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is driven by Cornerstone Gundog Academy. CGA is the world's most comprehensive online gundog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos that includes everything that you need to take a seven-week-old puppy to a finished gundog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com, sign up for the free preview module, and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gundog Academy, the most advanced gundog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 148. This week on the show, we're talking Dan's favorite topic, Diver Duck Hunting 101. We give you some tips and techniques to get you started chasing divers this season. All right, welcome to episode 148 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, where you're on demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. Check us out at hpoutdoors.com. Find us wherever you find quality podcast content. You can also find us across all social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And this week we're brought to you by Dunn Sporting Goods. Dunn's the family-owned and operated business with two locations, Peavely, Missouri, and Marion, Illinois. They've got over 60 years dedicated to providing the outdoorsmen with the best deals on hunting and fishing gear. Check out their selection at shopduns.com. So we'll follow them on Facebook and Instagram at shopduns and for weekly specials and giveaways. They've also got an HP Outdoors discount code, HPO, saves you 10%. Right now, their website's going through some updates, so if you want to uh, take advantage of that, make sure you hit up uh, Chad Duckworth, and he can um, get you squared away. Joining me this week, as he always does, Dan Harushka. Dan, what's up? I'm excited to talk about divers. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you're super pumped. <laughs> oh, man. We're, we're making a habit of recording on Sunday mornings, but um, yeah. You you had some more baseball going on. How was that? It was good. Um, very busy time of year for me, so kind of finding time to do this has been pretty challenging. Uh, so yeah, we're here Sunday morning. Gonna knock this out, and I'm I'm ready to go to the Crawford County Fair to go to a rodeo tonight. So we gotta hurry up so I can go get some ice cream and like candy corn or stuff like that. Mm. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, uh, that, let that, me let me let me ask you a question. No, I don't want to. Do, I don't want to answer do, any questions. Do you that. do you remember going? Do you remember the hey hey pop pop guy? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey hey pop pop. This guy that he ran a dartboard for years and years at our county fair, and he'd always go hey hey pop pop teddy bear, and it would just would get up in your face trying to get you to spend money and throw darts. But every time I walk in those gates, I think about that guy. Anyway. <laughs> I've been. I have not been to the Crawford County Fair in probably fifteen years, and I'm not really sad about that. Don't, no, I wouldn't be either. Don't really miss it too much. <laughs> I wouldn't be either. Anyway, let's let's move on here. Uh, I do want to thank this week as well. You can out in the field. How you've prepared determines how you'll perform. With balanced fat and protein to support peak condition, you can premium dog food enhances strength, energy, and endurance. So when the pavement ends and the truck doors swing open, you and your dogs are ready for anything. Strong, focused, and ready for anything. That's a Yukonuba dog. Also, thank you to Gunner Kennels, engineered for your dog, designed for travel, and built for your peace of mind. The G1 Kennel has set a new industry standard, put Gunner in a category all its own. They were started to protect your pet, and it continues to be at the center of everything that they do, and they're dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market because man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at GunnerKennels.com. Also, thank you this week to Old Town. Since 1898, Old Town has been building the most advanced quality watercraft products that give you the best experience on the water whether you're hunting fishing or enjoying a relaxing paddle on the lake there's a bow for every type of adventurer if you haven't seen it yet check out their new grab and go watercraft designed to function as your boat blind and retriever the easy to conceal 11 foot 9 inch and 56 pound solo sportsman is the ideal craft for those in search of a stable lightweight craft it's easy to paddle and even easier to transport or stash designed with the hunter and the angler in mind the solo sportsman is equipped with thoughtful shell tackle tool storage Comfortable adjustable seat, foot braces, an accessory track, rod holders. It's got all the goodies on there. Check it out at oldtowncanoe.com forward slash solo sportsman. All right, Dan, I think you could probably 
chase some divers pretty effectively in some some certain areas with the uh, old town solo sportsmen. Yeah. And I think that's I do what, I do plan on that. Yeah, yeah, I'll believe that when I see it. Um, but, you know, <laughs> we're talking diver duck hunting this week, and that's kind of been a long standing joke amongst us. Is you like to send me pictures of just rafts of diver ducks, canvas backs, redheads, whatever, and then rarely. Do you hunt them slash ever get an opportunity to hunt them? So um, you've got an elaborate diver duck decoy spread that consists of two ducks. And I know you're oh, going to tell me what you've on. added to it. But um, yeah, I know the truth. It's all good. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that this week. And guys, um, you know, it's kind of it's kind of funny because when you mentioned this topic to me, I was like, well, it's kind of a weird time of year to be talking about this. But then the more I thought about it, you know, if you're going to if you're going to pursue divers, depending on where you hunt them in the situation that you'll be hunting them in. If you're not getting prepared for that now, it's probably not something that you're going to pull together at the last minute, you know, and have a ton of success. Uh, having said that, I'm sure everybody listening to this show that's has, you know, killed a canvas back over like a dozen mallards is like, Oh, what are you talking about? You know, whatever. And there's absolutely situations where you can do that, you know? Um, but I think that's not going to be the reality for everybody. That's not the reality for where I'm at pretty much. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the differences and then some of the things that we think are important to have, some of the things that maybe aren't as important to have and just sort of some general tips and techniques to kind of get you going, get you in the mindset and get you started sort of preparing yourself to, to pursue divers this season. Yeah. You know, we had the preseason checklist last week, which I thought was a great episode and it got me thinking, you know, in our group, there's a ton of people that are buying all kinds of new stuff. They're getting into the sport, which is awesome to see. They have boxes showing up at their house every other day or work to, so their wife doesn't see it, whatever it may be. <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, what really, if they're in a, if they're in a situation where they have divers, is it that big of a transition equipment wise to be able to pursue both puddle, puddle ducks and divers? Right. So what I would kind of want to hit on that too, maybe, to open up that thought process for those people if they didn't ask questions already. And, you know, just like you said, tips and techniques to, to kind of get after it. And we'll try and hit a few different situations. Cause like you, like, you know, not everyone's hunting big water for divers. So, uh, we'll try and touch on a little bit of everything. Yeah. I think that's the big distinction here is whether you're pursuing divers on big water or if you're pursuing divers in, you know, still, I mean, what I would consider sort of pothole scenarios uh, where they're migrating, maybe pushing down a lot earlier in the season. You know, we don't we don't typically see divers in good pushes here until later in the year where I'll see some guys out kind of in the Midwest areas killing canvasbacks and stuff much earlier in the season than what we do. And, and again, this is just me kind of looking at social media and seeing what guys are posting and stuff like that. But it seems like those are more in like a slough sort of pot water you know, some bigger water, but you know, like not great lakes type water, uh, scenario. So I think those, those are the type of guys that are going to have the ability to sort of transit transition some of their typical gear that they would use and leverage that against the divers, where I think if you're going to hunt big water, you're probably looking at a little, little different package that you're going to take to the field than what you might, uh, you know, otherwise. And again, right. and, and I think the thing too, is like, the other thing to remember is you can hunt big water from the shore. So like that doesn't necessarily mean you're talking big, big boats and big, you know, you know, uh, you know, the pumpkin seed things like layout boats and things like that. Um, there's different ways to attack big water and we can go into some of that stuff too. But, uh, you know, I think there's going to be two sort of schools of thought there as far as I'm concerned, as far as the, the situation and the conditions that you're actually going to be hunting will dictate a lot of what you can use while you're diver duck hunting versus what you're using when you're puddle duck and diver hunting. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Another, another reason I thought of this uh, topic was remember when Casey Hopper was on, I it was one of our first shows and he's mm -hmm. like, yeah, the one day, you know, first day we limited on mallards and pintails. And then the next day we limited on yep. redheads and, and canvas bags. And this was all on a pond. Right. Yeah. So I was like, all right. And he sent pictures and it's really, you know, just a, uh, no bigger than a farm pond, no bigger than a, a football field. So yeah. it it can change in a day and this might help you get set up to, you know, be successful on something like that. Yeah. So maybe we talk <clears throat> about, uh, we start with some of the things that we think kind of translate over well, sort of gear that you can use 
uh, puddle duck hunting and diver duck hunting for those those smaller water situations. Um, you know, I think that's probably a, a legitimate place to start because that's probably the boat that a lot of people are in. Yeah, I'd say, you know, start with Texas rigs. A lot will transfer over. And and I, I kind of have a question on, for you. Like, you know, if you were setting up on a farm pond like that, would you still throw out your um, long lines or would you kind of try and bunch them up more as far as Texas rigs? So I'll say that I think you could probably do either one. Uh, personally, I would not run long lines on a smaller pondish type of water. Um, the major reason that I would not do that is because, again, these are this is my opinion. I think on a smaller body of water, you're likely to see birds coming in at a higher uh, elevation. You know, that, like because when I, when I hunt bigger water, the divers are on the deck, right? They're flying very low to the water a lot of times, and they're just you know they're they're cruising just a couple feet up off the water where if you're in a smaller pond where maybe they can't get down as quick, you know, maybe there's trees around or whatever. Um, they're going to have a, a more tendency to fly higher, I would guess. And the, 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 the benefit of a long line is because people will look at that line and they'll be like, well, ducks don't actually sit like that. They don't look like that on the water and they're right. They don't typically just swim in a line, but the, the long line thrives when a duck is down on the deck and it doesn't have the, the benefit of, being up and seeing that so from the from the deck it just looks like a bunch of birds knotted up on the water they can't tell that they're all in a line because they don't have that altitude to look at so i would be more inclined to hunt smaller pockets of water like i would a diver or a, a puddle duck spread where i would use probably more individual um rig decoys whether you're you know running normal you know keel grabber weights or texas rays or whatever it is um i'd probably run them individually and then I would definitely still incorporate uh, spinners and things like that that I would typically do if I was hunting uh, a di you know a, a puddle duck spread because motion is still as critical um, and sometimes even more so with divers because they're just looking for motion and, and something to uh, attract their attention uh, because especially if they're migratory they're thinking okay there's birds there there's food there that's where I need to go so you show activity and that, that's maybe enough to draw them in. That makes a lot of sense to me because I'm thinking back to eastern shore hunting and, um, you know, there were trees behind us. The other side of the flats were homes and trees and stuff like that. And those birds really didn't come down on the water. You know, they were they were pretty high and we used what just they weren't Texas rigs, but just, just you know, wraps and yeah, just yep. decoys yeah. and uh, kind of just bunched a ton together. But that that was very successful that day, too. Yeah, and I would also think that you're probably, I mean, again, these are some generalizations, right? Because that isn't really the environment that I hunt in, but just sort of like thinking it through. This is sort of what I'm, I'm getting here is, you know, you're probably not going to need the volume of decoys that we would run like on a big water set where you're trying to draw attention from a long ways off. Uh, so, you know, you don't, it wouldn't be as big of a burden to run single single rigs versus long lines and things like that so i mean that's the real benefit of a long line is you can you can drop a dozen decoys in no time pick them up in no time that kind of thing so so let me ask you this so someone this is their first year they just bought two dozen mallard decoys they bought texas rigs for those and now we're talking about this and they're like man i see diver ducks and i wonder what i should buy first as far as decoys go yeah. What do you, what do you, what's your first purchase? Well, I mean, I would say it depends on what you see in your area, first and foremost. But generally speaking, um, I think bluebills are kind of the commonly associated duck for divers to hunt over because they will pull a lot of bird species in. Uh, it seems like black and white contrast is very, very important when hunting divers. Mm -hmm. And many birds will decoy to that. Bluebills, canvasbacks, redheads, things like that will all come to those. Uh, the ducks that I, that I've experienced with it tend to like the see their own in the thread are buffle heads and golden eyes. Those are the two for sure that I know, uh, will do that. So, you know, if you see a lot of buffle heads in your area, I've definitely had buffle heads come into a spread with, when I didn't have a single buffle head decoy out, but more times than not, when I have a decoy spread out and I put a pocket of buffle heads out, if I have a buffle head come in, they'll go to that pocket or somewhere nearby where their, their other, uh, similar species are at. So. I would start with the bluebills and then 
from there, I would just build, build on what you see. I mean, if you are hunting areas where you're seeing primarily redheads, I mean, that's what you should go with. If you're seeing like where we hunt, where we see a good variety, I like to go uh, a solid base of buffle head, or, sorry, a solid base of blue head, blue bills and canvas backs is sort of my core uh, substance of my spread. And then I sprinkle in redheads and uh, buffle heads. And we can talk a little bit about decoy placement in, in a little bit later, but like that's sort of the core because that will draw the most, uh, most birds, you know, the most variety of birds because of this, the, the nice white pop and contrast that, the, that those decoys will give you. Okay. So moving on from a farm pond esque setup, what about, what would your go-to rigs be for a river, like a, a fairly fast moving river? Where someone's seeing these birds. Oh boy. Yeah, that's tough. Um, are you, when you're talking, f- I, so I'm by fast moving, I'm assuming you're meaning like tidal or like, cause I mean, I've never hunted divers over like a, what I would consider like a, a super, f- like, um, like the river where I, where I hunt is more like a lake. Like it, the water moves, but it's because of tidal, not because of current necessarily. Okay. Um, I mean, are you referring to like a, like let's say, yeah, let's say, like uh, let's river, say, let's say, uh, let's say even like the outflow at Jamestown out of Pymie. So 50 yards across, maybe up to 75 yards across, pretty deep moves, pretty decent. Mm. And you're seeing divers in that water. Sure. Um, yeah, that doesn't, to me, that doesn't strike me as, as prime diver habitat, but, um, <laughs> I mean, I think the biggest thing to consider when you're talking about uh, deep water is you're not going to be running Texas rigs, right? <laughs> right. So, and if you're only talking 50 yards wide, you're probably not going to be running long lines across the entire thing or, you know, two thirds of the thing. So I, I would still be individually rigged there with long lines um, on the decoy to get to the bottom, but ensuring that I have enough weight because obviously with, with that much flow, you're going to have a hard time keeping your decoys in place if you don't have them weighted down really well. So that's definitely something to consider. And if you're using these bigger diver decoys, like the battleship Higdens and things like that, or foam filled that are a little bit heavier in general, you know, you're going to have to make sure you got enough weight. So if you're hunting like four ounce decoy weights on your divers, and then you throw them over on your, or on your puddle duck, sorry. And then you throw those over on your divers, you're probably going to be chasing decoys a lot because that's just not going to hold them. So, um, you know, a little extra line to make sure you get a good angle of drag on the bottom and then just enough weight to hold them in place. And that's really going to be dependent on, the, the amount of current you're talking and the amount of vegetation and things on the bottom of the, the water that, you know, your weights could grab onto. Good answer. Makes sense. But I, I mean, I honestly, I, I mean, I don't, I, to me, that would probably be a scenario where like all your other water is locked up and that's yeah. the only water that's open. So in that situation, you may not even need to really worry about your decoys in that situation. Um, the, the biggest thing that I've always had issues with when hunting and rigging is ice. You know, even the smallest little skim of ice on the water, if it like where we hunt when it's tidal and the water starts moving in or out, and if your decoys are out, and even if it's a small skim, it will just, just completely wreck your decoy spread. So um, it's almost worth like waiting until the it warms up a little bit and that that gets that skim of ice kind of melts off and breaks off. Because even the smallest amount of ice I've had really hard, really bad issues with uh, pulling decoys around. Yeah. So when you set up like that, are you, I guess when you, when you have done that, were you on long lines and it just pulled everything or yeah. even well, I've Texas done, rigs? I've both. Um, yeah. I mean, long lines are typically better for me because I put bigger weights on them. I mean, you know, we're talking like five pounds plus on each end. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and it will still pull that. Um, cool. and I've had where it will actually pull and break decoys off the line or whatever. I mean, the ice gets, especially when it gets thicker, it can be a real problem. Um, if you're on, if that's a situation that you have to deal with. So, uh, if you're going individually rigged, you're, I mean, I've snapped off countless PVC corded decoy rigs, uh, over the years hunting divers with, because of ice, it just, it just wrecks your spread. If you're, yeah, and that, that takes me back to, um, the episode with the Hudnalls and, you know, the flooding that they dealt with and everything that comes down the river with that and just, yep. you know, they're, well, they're nice. in their boat picking up dozens of decoys because exactly everything that. just gets nailed you get, down. You get like a deadfall that floats down the river, comes out of the river and 
I mean, it's taking whatever it wants with it. So yeah, yeah, that can be a really frustrating part for hunting on water that's moving. Um, one thing that I think is cool that you do is the leaf bag yep. approach mm-hmm. to taking out. Maybe explain that to some of the people that haven't listened before. Yeah, so um, I like to use uh, leaf bags for my uh, my decoys, and I really like to leave the decoys attached to the main line. This is long line hunting we're talking here. You know, you'll see guys spool up the line and take the decoys on and off with clips and things like that, and or you'll see a variety of different ways to do it. I like the leaf bags because it's cheap. It's just easy. The bags are pretty durable. They're like fifteen bucks a piece, and I've, you know, I've had them for probably five years now, and they're they're fine. You know, they're not perfect, but I don't treat them you know, with, with white gloves, I beat them. So, uh, you know, it's, okay. and he's talking about like Ryobi leaf, leaf yeah, they're bags like the from canvas. Home Depot. Yeah. They're like the so. canvas ones that they fold up. And then when you're empty, you can fold them down and clip them closed. So they're nice and flat. And, uh, you know, they'll hold depending on the size of your decoys. I lo- I run a lot of the Higdon sort of, uh, life size, smaller decoys. So I can get like two dozen in there pretty easily. And what I'll do is, I'll get um, from Walmart, I'll get motorcycle nets, you know, stuff that guys use on the back of their motorcycles to sort of net down jackets and gear. Uh, I'll throw that over the top and I'll clip it to the bottom so that if the decoy bag falls or rolls over, whatever, the decoys don't come out. And I just, I just put the, I leave the decoys on the line and I just put them in as we pick, as we pick them up. I just, I just put the decoys into the bag on the main line, never unclip them and, when they when we hunt the next time, I take the long the main line and I grab them and I just set them out and they don't tangle. And the key to this is one having a thick enough main line. You definitely have to get a tangle free main line. So if you're hunting with like paracord as your main line, this is not going to work. Like you are if you're hunting with paracord paracord, you probably hate diver hunting because I guarantee you're dealing with knots and tangles all the time. But if you're using with a thicker or a more rigid line or something that won't tangle. As long as you grab the decoys by the main line, when you put them in and take them out, they will self untangle. When you start grabbing each individual decoy and start throwing them in, the droppers and the main line and stuff will all get balled up. And that's how you get your tangle. So going in and out by just using the main line is a lifesaver for me. It saves tons of time. I don't have to clip and reclip decoys every time. Um, I can keep my variety. I pull them out in my backyard. I set them how I want. Like if I'm going two drakes and a hen or whatever my, my setup is. And then I just go with my bag and I walk by them and I just drop the line in and I just grab the main line the whole way. And I've never had problems with that tangling. The only times I've ever had tangles long line hunting is because of, uh, ice you know ice flows getting in my stuff and then when you're in the boat you're just trying to save every decoy you can so you don't really care if it gets tangled up and you deal with it later but uh yeah that's the biggest key is grabbing the decoys by the main line and putting them in and out don't worry about the dropper they'll be fine they will they will not tangle with the caveat that you've got a main line that's thick enough and or tangle free of some some flavor so my next question is how deep is the water where you are setting these decoys yeah that's actually so we, we, we struggle with water depth, but it's not because it's super deep. It's because it changes in depth throughout the morning. So I may hunt mm-hmm. a morning hunt where the, where I set and it's only four, four feet deep and I'm running my long lines. And then a couple hours later, that water's up to six feet deep. And the first decoy or two in my long line are underwater <laughs> because, yeah. um, you know, the tides come up, the anchor holds it down. So you lose a couple decoys under the water like that. Um, so I don't really deal with deep water. I do try to factor for tide to the best that I can. But, you know, if I, if I, if I, if for part of my morning hunt, you know, I, I got a decoy in the front that's underwater. I don't, I don't really stress it too much, but, uh, I, I don't run extra anchor lines off of my main lines. I just take the main line, anchor the end of it and throw it down and start from there. Uh, if you're hunting really deep water, you're going to want to definitely have an anchor line that you would set based on the depth and then tie off to the anchor line with your long line, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So you would need essentially three separate lines, one for each end of the anchor and then your main line that the decoys will be on. Um, that's that's something that a lot of guys that are hunting big water, you know, Great Lakes type stuff is probably going to have to deal with more than uh, – you know, what we deal with here. And even when we've hunted the Chesapeake, a lot of the areas that we hunt in the Chesapeake are shallow and we haven't really had a problem uh, with that because not that we don't have deeper water in our areas, but the diver ducks tend to, tend to frequent the more shallower areas because it's easier for them to get to vegetation and to get to food. 
um, in those areas. They don't have to dive super deep in those areas to get, to get food. So it's just easier. Right. So on the opposite of what you do, um, when I diver hunt, usually I'm, I have a buddy with me and I'm, I'm still one that, uh, wraps my, my long line up. And then at what we do, cause everything that we hunt, obviously it's not title here. It's just local lakes. And I will take the end of it and I'll, you know, clip the first one on, start walking. And the guy, the other guy with me has the main, uh, line still in his hands. And then he'll just clip every so often, he'll clip a decoy on and I'll just walk it out to where I want it to, you know, depending on the setup that we want. So I walk it out and, uh, you know, that's Conneaut Lake or Pymie, wherever we're at. And we'll just go to where, you know, essentially, uh, top of my waders and, and set it out that way. So if I do, uh, if I do solo diver hunts, usually I just will do Texas rigs cause I have enough rigs to do that. But, um, yeah, if we use the long lines and like you said, it just, the, the optics that they have when they're, when they're on the deck flying, it, it kind of just guides them in better. Right. So, so they see that they follow the long lines right into your shooting hole essentially. Well, yeah, it depends. So like where we hunt, you know, birds aren't dumb and they get educated pretty quickly. So a lot of times they will fly the end of our long lines. So, you know, a lot of people will say, Hey, you know, you run your long lines either straight or 45 degree out from your blind so that they see that. And then they fly right up the line into your kill hole, which is in front of your blind. Uh, you can definitely do it that way. And we've done it that way. But oftentimes I will set my lines parallel. Sorry. Uh, yeah, parallel to the blind. So not going straight to me, but going across my face. And why that's important for me is because a lot of times the birds in our air are educated, so they will skirt the edge of your decoys, right? So if you set your long lines, unless you have the long line running right up to the blind, you're talking probably 30, 40 yards at the end of your line, then whatever the duck flies is a cushion off of that as they come by the spread. Um, I've found if you turn them parallel, to the blind, you can get them a little bit closer and you can, you can draw birds in a little closer because they still are, they're still skirting the decoys, but they don't realize that that end of that decoy is, is with, is at 25 yards. So now they're, they're in easier killable range. Um, the other, the thing you have to consider with that is wind is going to play a little more importance. And then you put your, your cluster of decoys. If you do that, you know, you're kind of your kill hole on the upwind side of your, of your blind so that the birds can kind of swim or can fly up the line. Uh, across your blind face and then it's sort of more like a goose hunt where you got to be disciplined and know like who's shooting what lanes and when to call the shots so that everyone can kind of get a piece of the the group that's coming in or whatever but there's different ways to do it another way to draw birds to where you want them in the decoy spread is to use spinners motion decoys things like that because uh, diver ducks historically are pretty aggressive in feeding patterns um, so they will actually they want to they want to fly up the line not because like you're you're directing them for any reason but they want to fly up the line because they believe that that's the direction where the food is and that the birds in the front of the line are getting the best food so they will fly all the way up there to try to jump the line and get up there if they're comfortable right if you got a good conceal and they're comfortable they'll go all the way up the line to that little pocket that you've created to try to get to the food so that's a good spot to have your de your spinning wing decoys and stuff because they, they think it's other birds flying up the line and they're going to fly up that line as well to get after it um, that's why coot always often work as well as confidence decoys because coots are known to be very aggressive feeders so you know birds will be like well if the coots are in there feeding then that must mean there's food there so they're definitely going to go there so that's a that's why they work really well as a common uh as a as a confidence decoy but again it's just another way to get them to do it uh depending on what your situation i mean if you're hunting you know a shore blind where you're not you don't have any like uh geographical uh land topography to help you you know that's one way you can do it if you're hunting like a, a lake or something where you can get out on a point you may want to run a little bit different because you know you run your line straight out and then birds that are kind of traversing that that corner that you've got on the island you know on the point you know they're more likely to see that line of decoys and turn towards you vice if you keep it parallel to your location they're, they're more likely to just fly by you kind of thing so you probably depending on your situation right and like your ability to and what you assess is your ability to actually finish the birds in your lap is probably going to dictate how you want to set your your decoys to have for most success I like that. So one thing that I don't even think I've talked to you off the show about this, but it really seems about the last two or three years, the evolution of a decoy raft has been 
all over social media, right? Yeah. People using these. What are your thoughts on those? And will you ever deploy one? Well, I think they're fine and I, I have no issue with them. I think they, they look great. They make sense. Um, I think the issue for me would be just, I don't, I hunt out of small boats, small platforms. So I wouldn't have a lot of real estate for stuff like that. But if you do, I think that they would work. You know, I, I've seen some drone footage recently of birds flying over uh, long lines and the long lines were actually white and you could see them from the air yeah. that the white, the light lines were white under the water. Uh, the birds didn't care. Uh, they didn't care one bit. So I think, you know, any concern of like seeing this dark mat under the water or anything like that is probably null, especially if they're flying on the deck. They're definitely not going to uh, have concerns with that. Um, the speed and the ability to deploy it quickly is kind of cool. Um, you know, I think <laughs> I could just see, though, if you were hunting ice or you get like a dead a down a deadfall that comes by. I mean, it could just wreak havoc on that net <laughs> potentially. Right. I mean, I've never had hands on with one of those nets. I've seen people make their own, but I know some of the commercial ones are out there as well. Um, again, I think any in in diver hunting on big water, typically numbers are the name of the game. Some people will say I'd rather have a bunch of smaller ones. Other people will say I'd rather have few bigger ones. Other people say, you know, hey, I want to spread them out, have a big footprint. Other people say, I want to concentrate them and have just a knot right here in this one spot. Um, I would just say whatever, you know, try different things and whatever you have success doing, keep on that and build off of that. That sort of helps you solve the puzzle. If you're not having success and you're just really struggling to get, you know, find out what works, try something different. Maybe cluster them all together. You know, just because you see it on a DU magazine or you hear it on this show doesn't mean that it's going to work everywhere and it has to be that way. Don't be afraid to mix it up, especially if you're not having any success. What do you have to lose? So let me ask you this. If, say, a lot of people in our group have uh, small crafts, canoes, mm -hmm. kayaks, and they... Um, just aren't seeing a lot of divers around the shore how could they potentially hunt kind of off the shore a little bit and still be successful how would you how would you set up out of your canoe and say you're floating out there mm. uh yeah i don't know if i can with a good conscience say that i would recommend anybody floating offshore shooting divers out of a canoe um i i think that's just a very dangerous recipe for disaster um I say that with the caveat is it depends on how deep the water is, right? Like if you can hunt offshore and three to four feet of water, I'd be more inclined to try that where if I flop the canoe over, I can at least stand up. Uh, if, right. it's, if it's deeper water, I would absolutely not recommend doing that. Um, I purposely, when I hunt divers out of my canoe, I do not go in water over my head. I just, I don't do it. Um, for that, for that particular reason, because I, I knowingly push the limits of what amount of gear I could, I bring with me. Cause I know I need big numbers, but I also know that the water is usually like three feet where I'm at with my canoe. And what I like to do is I will, I know this isn't getting to your question, but what I will do is where I'm going to hunt, I will pull the long lines along the shore and I will stay in that shallow water and I'll pull them out. And then whoever I'm hunting with, I will have them walk up in front of the blind or wherever we're going to hunt to a depth that's, um, you know, the distance that's reasonable from the blind drop the weight and then I will walk them out uh, from the blind or where we're hunting until it's a depth that I'm com I'm not comfortable going past and then I will drop them right there. So, mm -hmm. you know, I ensure that I'm in, in safe water depth. If you want, I, I think you probably could st if you're in water that's shallow enough, you know, kind of like we talked about in our uh, hunting out of small boats episode, you could probably stabilize your canoe slash kayak a little bit to where you drive, you know, like snow stakes or whatever those green things are called garden stakes into the, into the ground and, and sea clamp your boat to them, give you a little a more, tea, tea, a tea post or something. Yeah. Yeah. And give yourself some more stability and you could sort of hunt it like a layout boat kind of thing. But, or outriggers. Yeah, but I would I would be very, very hesitant to recommend someone doing that for divers. Very, I would be, you know, I can't, I, I, yeah, I just think that that's a really dangerous thing to do. Um, shooting out of a canoe can be dangerous business anyway if it's unstabilized, for sure. Uh, if you've never shot out of one and then you take a 90-degree shot out to your side, you definitely could go swimming. Um I, I always am I'm, I'm more sensitive, not that you shouldn't always be safe, but I'm very, I'm very cautious when it comes to diver duck hunting, because for us, that's usually December, January timeframe, very, very cold, very, you know, slim margin for error. And when you're hunting water like us here with tide, when you've got 
you know, certain winds on falling tides, the water can get nasty really quick. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, like just so be, being wet and being an hour away from safety could, yeah, I mean, that's it's just not, it's not good. Never great. Um, so, I mean, I would think, you know, if you wanted to hunt offshore, you probably need to look into something different, like a, a layout boat where you, you know, where you can get away and, um, you know, I, I don't hunt like that. I don't have that. So I, I'm not really, uh, positioned to speak on that too much, but everything I've done offshore has been on a, a bigger boat where I'm comfortable with what we've got going on and the weight and the yep. boat and all that kind of stuff. So I would be very hesitant to push it in your small platform boats. And that is, you know, one of the guys I hunt with, um, was hunting by himself one day and he, you know, the, the paddle wasn't very long, but the same thing kind of sitting in his boat and a couple birds fly by shoots. And before you know it, he's underwater, you know, flip the thing straight back. And he's like, man, I, you know, he wasn't turned that much, but just that little bit and, you know, trying to swing through that momentum swung him all the way over. And, you know, he's like, I was soaked, got out, got right in my truck and, and that, that's the end of the day. So, yeah, you no, know, most people, that's hunt, a, most people that hunt out of canoes, when you're in the canoe, you're very cautious of like your weight distribution and what you're doing. And, you know, you'll get different varying levels of comfort, but you're always sort of like aware that you're in a canoe and even the most stable canoes, comparatively speaking to bigger boats are not that stable. Right. right. And when the time comes where you're hunting birds and it's action time and you're trying to make that good shot and you're focused on the lead and the fall through and all that kind of stuff, your mind is no longer on, you know, keeping your swell, your weight centered and all these kinds of things. So you, you are very likely to make a mistake and end up wet in that situation. So again, I don't recommend trying to use your small craft as layout boats or anything like that. If you can paddle out to a marsh area where there's like vegetation and things that you can kind of like st stabilize yourself in. Uh, I think that can be an effective way to do it, but just to go out there and sort of float around in a, in a canoe, um, I would definitely not recommend that. There you go. I think that's good advice. I think a lot of people try and push that and, um, you know, we don't want to see or hear you end up in a bad situation. So no, no doubt. Good advice. No question. <sighs> That's a lot of that's a lot of my questions that I have for you. I think it's a it's a fairly you know easy transition to get out and and hunt divers if you see them. You know, just just having those decoys and like you said, you know the the intro the intro of this being my favorite subject. It was a running joke that I had two diver duck decoys there for a while, and I do have a good uh, good amount of decoys now. And we get out and you know bang on them every once in a while, but it's not a um, I guess it's just not my forte yet. And it's a, it was an easy transition. You know, you get the, you have your rigs and you have the new decoys, you get out, set them up, however it may be. And, and you know, the experience and things that you learn, you get better each time. So this is a quick, uh, quick overview of what things to look for. What, I, I guess, what else safety wise would you think of or things that you've well, learned that I think, I think I would, you know, I, I safety wise kind of, on top of this is uh, it leads me to gear, right? I keep thinking about gear because I think one of the reasons why a lot of people don't pursue divers wholeheartedly initially is because it's, it's a lot more gear intensive depending on where you're hunting and what your situation is. You know, I hunt, I usually don't hunt more than a dozen or two dozen diver duck, uh, the puddle duck decoys when I hunt puddle ducks, when I hunt divers, I'm hunting five, six, sometimes seven dozen decoys out of a canoe. And I do that by the, I mean, I push it, right? I, I, I'll tell you right now, I push it and I stay in shallow water and knock on wood, I've never been wet, but I push it. And I do that because I know I'm in shallow water where I, if I need to, I can just stick my leg out and stand up. And that's what it takes to be, you know, to, to draw birds on big water where we hunt. Now, having said that, with that comes a lot of weight. And, you know, it's not just you paddling a canoe. I'm on a trolling motor. Uh, two dudes, bunch of gear. Like we, we push the limits of what this canoe can handle, but we we've tested it. We did it in the, uh, in the summertime when the water was warm. So we got comfortable with what we were doing. And you know, I think that the, it's just one of those things where you have to kind of think ahead a little bit because you're not going to just be standing on the shore, typically pitching decoys. You know, you're talking about more decoys, more lines, more weight. Where do you want to set them? We touched on this a little bit, but you know, oftentimes I will throw 
some honker decoys out for visibility. I'll throw my long lines out. And then on individual rigs, I'll throw out some buffle heads. And uh, we don't see many gold knives, so I don't really throw out any of those. But on my long lines, I'll, I'll intermix bluebills, cans, redheads. I don't really care. Um, I'll, set the, I'll set the buffle heads off to the side. Typically, they will decoy off to that side with them. And then I will set my honkers on the downwind side because the honkers will not typically like to finish over top of the ducks. So I will set the honker decoys on the downwind side of our hide and they will often approach from the downwind side and, and land short of the duck decoys, providing that side of the blind a better op- shooting opportunities at, at the honkers. Having said all that, like it, that takes up a ton of space and a ton of room and it's expensive, right? So, I mean, these are all uh, obstacles of entry to people really getting immersed in the diver type of hunting. But having said that, um, you also want to think about if you're going to hunt over your puddle duck spread, diver decoy, diver decoys take a beating. Those ducks come down low. They get those decoys get shot a lot. <laughs> so I definitely recommend doing foam filled decoys, which again, adds to the weight and the, the, this, the weight of the gear that you're trying to get out there. So you know, those are all, those are all things that factor into the safety of it, especially, um, you know, if you're going to run a dog, for an example, you need to think about your long lines and the length of your droppers. You know, I like to run 18 inch droppers, um, because I don't hunt with the dog, but maybe you want to go to 36 inch dropper. So it's enough room for your dog to paddle through the the long lines without getting hung up, things like that. Um, you know, a lot of things to, to take into consideration when you're making that jump to, I sort of, I mean, again, I look at it as a completely different ball, ball game. You know, you can hunt decoys on or hunt divers on pocket water in certain areas and have them probably act very similar to dive, uh, to puddle ducks where we hunt. It's not the same. And you have to take a, a good look at, you know, how you're going to approach that and what you're going to do with that. Because sometimes depending on where the tide's going, you shoot a duck and that, that duck's floating away already. Like, you know, it's like, it's going. So are you going to have a dog? Are you going to chase it up with your canoe or your kayak? Or do you have a boat? Like, you know, how are you going to do that? How are you going to, if you're boat hunting, how are you going to work your anchor system where you can get back into your spot after you chase that duck up? All that kind of stuff factors in. And it's definitely not something that you can do, you know, well, the first time you got to sort of think through it, rehearse it. It's, I like to do it when it's warm. So, you know, I'm standing in the water, kind of wet wading around, sort of thinking how we're going to do this kind of stuff. It just makes it smoother and easier to do when it's cold and you're freezing your tail off and, you know, the stakes are a lot higher. So yeah. definitely things to think about. Um, when you wake up in the morning and check the weather report and you see some higher winds, does that make you adjust your amount of equipment that you're putting in the boat? Um, no, I don't adjust the amount of equipment for me. When I see wind, it's either a go or no go. Like if the wind is like 20 mile an hour, um, that's pretty dangerous for me in a lightweight canoe, no matter how much gear you have in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, again, I got a trolling motor on there. It moves you, but it doesn't move you that well. If you're paddling, you're probably in even worse shape. Uh, you're just not going to be able to control yourself much against that wind. And especially if you got tide considerations, I've definitely been coming back in where the wind picked up and we recognize, all right, it's time to go. And we roll, we're rolling in and with the tides changing and I've had water coming over the sides of the canoe multiple times and it's just a dicey deal. Right. And it's not mm-hmm. something that you want to get into a lot. Uh, so I'm very, very, uh, aware of wind and I love to hunt in wind, but when it gets to be too much, you just gotta, you gotta recognize what's safe and what's unsafe. And I've definitely passed on hunts because of the wind, which is going to be too much. Yep. And this takes me back to safety, go back to our PFD episode and make sure that pretty much any time you're in a small craft, you should have something on, but definitely, you know, there are a lot of state laws that come into effect. Uh, November 1 is ours, especially here in PA. Uh, once you hit that date, it is required to wear a PFD. So um, can't say enough about that. And the the statistics that are thrown out on that episode uh, with Brian is, is pretty alarming. So definitely, 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 definitely wear a PFD. I don't even know what the Virginia law is on that because I would never consider going out in something like that without a PFD. I don't care what it is. So um, I would definitely challenge everyone to forget the law. Just wear one. (laughs) That way you're covered, right? Yeah. When he's saying that. (laughs) You're covered safe, you know, all that stuff. (laughs) When he's saying that, you know, what I forget what the number was, 80% of drownings happen within five feet of your watercraft. Yeah. That's because people aren't wearing PFDs like that. That should open your eyes. And and it, after that episode, it was so awesome to see all the people that were actually going out and buying them. They're like, hey, you know, I've been on the fence about it and just did it. And then, you know, some people bought them and 
and then had issues right after. And they thanked us for having that because who knows what would happen if they didn't have their PFD on. So, and that's not even, you know, we had people message us that were walking and got tangled up in some current. They got tangled up in, you know, whatever the brush was underneath and, you know, lost their $1,800 gun and almost got swept out with some of the current going on. And, you know, said they won't, they won't hunt the bank or go and try and retrieve ducks without a PFD either. So going back to safety, just be careful. And, you know, we say it every year, but there's always two, three, four times that you see people drowning and, and we're trying to get, get the word out as much as we can to be safe and, and have fun. You know, people, people do care at home and, and want you showing up and no duck is worth dying. So, (laughs) yeah, I mean, we've, you know, we've talked about this so much and I can remember as a kid, there was a big push to like get people to wear their seatbelts in vehicles. And I feel like now that's more of a common thing than probably what it was when I was a kid. And I feel like that same push needs to be made for people, especially in the duck hunting community, wearing PFDs um, at any point. Cause you just never know. Right. And just when you think it's just like everything, right. You know, you can hunt ducks for 20 years. And just when you think you've got to figure it out, something else comes up and you're like, huh, never saw that before. Couldn't anticipated that or whatever it is. Um, the same could be said for, Oh, I've spent 20 years in my canoe or my kayak and I, I have, I have complete control out there, blah, 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 blah. No, you don't. <laughs> you definitely don't. And in fact, I would argue that that type of um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to call anybody arrogant, but that is an arrogant type thought process. Uh, if you, if you get yourself in that position where you think you're invincible, where you think you have it all figured out, that is probably when you are at your most vulnerable because you mm-hmm. will, you will be more inclined to push it when you know you shouldn't, um, or, or whatever it is. So even if you've got that one buddy in the group that, that it's like that, you know, it takes a leader to say, no, like we're not doing it today. Like, you know. And we're going to go home, we're going to get breakfast, and we're going to come back to, you know, fight another day. Yep. So definitely something to consider as we go into this season. Yes, sir. So what else you got? Anything? I think that's pretty much, that was I, a good. I think we, I think we sort of hit the highlights there. Um, again, yeah. this is 101, sort of basic stuff, right? If you're looking to get into it here for the first time. I mean, I love, I love diver hunting. It's sort of, um, I mean, I, I'm, I love duck hunting in general, but I, I really love shooting at canvas backs or bluebills coming low in the water, buzzing your spread. Um, it's some of the most fun, fast paced hunting that I've ever been involved with. And I just, I can't get enough of it. So I would encourage anybody who ever thought that like, you know, Oh, I only put puddle ducks. I have no interest in trying divers, you know, give it a shot, see what you, you know, be a little open-minded to that. If you haven't been in the past, I promise you it's some great ducking action. And, uh, here on the Atlantic flyway, you know, with, with uh, limits and things the way that they are, leveraging a diver duck hunt can be some of the best hunting that we have available to us. So if you haven't done it in the past, you may, this year may be the year that you want to try to give it a shot. And, uh, you know, we're available for questions and stuff. Get over to the Facebook group. We love to have dialogue in there. Um, I mean, there's so much expertise in there now. Like I don't even have to like respond to people hardly because there's just so much institutional knowledge amongst the people in that group that I just like to sit back and read. And I I I really like how it's become (laughs) sort of a a tool of the people, right? I mean, it's the tool of the, of the, of the group that listened to this show and every, and hunters helping hunters. That's what's going on in there. Um, and I just like watching that go. So I let, you know, I, I try to stay out of it to the, to the extent that I can. Cause I mean, you got to listen to me yak for 50 minutes on this show. Uh, I'll let other people with institutional knowledge share it in the group. Yep. And they're super helpful. You want to know what's super, super cool is we'll have people message us on the side and be like, Hey, um, I'm from, you know, where I think the last one was out of Texas, somewhere down in Texas. And they're like, do you know anyone down there or, you know, places I can go? Well, no, I don't specifically know that area, but I'll tell you what, get in our Facebook group and, you know, check the roll call. This guy went in, I said, just make a post and say where you're from. And if anyone's willing to help you out, there were like seven people that right away said, yeah, let's go. Like, how far away are you even, you know, a couple or a couple of hours out, but they're like, if you want to meet up, let's, let's get after it. You know what? It's like, man, I'll tell you what people, people want to say things about our, our, our group and, and what we've created, but you post that in, in hardcore waterfowl and see how that goes. Right? Yep. Yep. It is, it is a difference. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of what that, what that group has become. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just awesome to see hunters helping hunters. It's, it's just great. 
Yeah. And like you said, the knowledge, I, I've i taken a back seat as well. Usually I would get right in and, and sometimes I do still re- respond right away because I get that notification and I'm on it just to, you know, respond and, and see what other people say. But sometimes you take a back seat and the, some of the things, some of the comments that are put up there are things that I never thought of. Right. So it's like, man, just having that, you know, nationwide survey essentially and people putting their input in and you know if if anyone's not up to par or being a jerk then they're gone it's been that it's been that quick lately so (laughs) super cool uh good episode i think it's depending where you're at like you said it can be very easy transition even if it's you know two dozen decoys a dozen decoys and go try it out and like you said it can be very fast and i have to admit usually you know, you've always been kind of the duck guy, right? Like, give me ducks over geese anytime. And I've always been geese and cut cornfield, which I still absolutely love. But I have to admit, even with the reductions and limits this year, I'm looking forward to duck hunting more than goose hunting. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. It's just, hey, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but. One thing I forgot um, to mention that I think is probably something worthwhile for this episode. A lot of guys, we talked about the gear for diver hunting. Um you can grab, you know, if you've got a, a sack of old mallards laying around or you see some in a garage sale or on Craigslist for cheap, pick them things up and you can paint those. Just throw some black and white on them. You don't have to get real detailed, just black and white. Man, you can crush divers over those. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be an expensive thing. I've seen guys um, drill holes in old decoys in like the butt area and then just get some of that um, great stuff spray foam from Home Depot, yep. spray yep. it full of foam. Dude, those things will float forever. You know what I mean? Like it does not have to be hundred bucks a dozen type diver decoys. It's certainly, you know, you can, but like, it doesn't have to, right. Especially if you're getting started, there, there's ways to do it. And, um, you know, don't let the gear piece hold you back. If you, if you want to get into it, there's definitely cheap ways to do it. Yep. So. And try it out. It's fun. Yeah. And it, it definitely tests your, uh, Birds in flight knowledge too. So know oh, what you're no shooting question. at. And no question. I guess we should probably go back and cover all that too. But anyway, uh, definitely fun. Definitely something you should look into. And I think it's a good episode, man. Okay. You got one last thing here before we, we get out? No, I'm ready for, uh, for some, uh, cotton candy, I think, or something. Well, I got one last thing. I'm getting ready to, uh, here in 10 minutes, I'm getting ready to go upstairs and watch the Little League World Series. The Southeast Regional Champions are from uh, South Riding, Virginia, which is about 10 minutes from where I live. And I used to live in that area. Uh, so super excited to see a Little League team from our district get up there. And My son and I drove up there on Thursday last week to watch them play their opening game. And <laughs> they got rained out. So that was really unfortunate. But uh, we're excited to uh, to watch them and support them. So a uh, shout out to the uh, Loud South Little League. And hopefully they take it all the way there in Williamsport. Get it. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, I do want to thank just for a minute, Dunn Sporting Goods, Yukonuba, Gunner Kennels, and Old Town. And also thank you to Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most, the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos, includes everything you need to take a seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com to sign up for their free free, free preview module and begin your training journey today. I tell you, um, I've seen countless success stories on social media uh, from Cornerstone Gundog Academy. So if you're you're getting a pup and you're looking for a great tra- training program, uh, I don't think you'll find one that's more highly endorsed than the uh, Cornerstone Gundog Academy. So make sure you check them out. It is the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. All right, that does it for episode 148. Hopefully you enjoyed our talk about diver duck hunting 101 and hopefully get you, get you pointed in the right direction for this coming season. If you're new to the show, head over to iTunes, check out all of our past episodes. While you're there, you can leave us a five-star rating and review. It'll help like-minded hunters just like you find our show. That's going to do it for this week. So until next week, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.